Welcome to Kimecast, where we break through and cut the BS in sports medicine, rehabilitation, and sports performance, and talk about how things really work. Welcome back to Kimecast. So season two, getting kicked off here. So excited to be back with you guys. Now, our big goal of this podcast is really to be able to share both business insights and where the industry is in regards to physical therapy, sports medicine, sports performance, rehabilitation are all topics we love to cover here and get down into the heart of of the business aspects of it, as well as discuss the skills and specific examples of improved performance in the clinical setting. So whether it be skill sets you need, communication strategies you have, are things we intend to communicate and and talk about as we go through this Kimecast and Continuum. So today I'm joined here with Russ Dunning. So Tony Mikla, Russ Dunning, uh, excited to be with you guys. So we're going to jump right into more of the state of the industry and talk a little more on the business side today as we get things kicked off here. So I think it's we're in an interesting time in in life, right? In the in the in the economy in the U.S. Here we're in January of uh, 2024. And the craziness and the chaos that's out there, and certainly we've talked about healthcare for years and the needs for healthcare reform. And I think we can all could agree that the healthcare system is is broken. I think that people who use the system find that it's it's a dysfunctional system that has tremendous challenges. Uh, but for us, in the actual providing care for patients, well, let's talk about some of what those challenges are that that we actually that we actually face and, and what are really real. You know, I think that what is less understood and less really discussed out there is the impact of the insurance companies on care. And everybody wants to say, well, the insurance companies aren't determining uh, healthcare and what kind of care you're getting, but that's just absolutely false. There's just, oh, yeah. there's, what a myth. Yeah, it's it's 100% that the insurance companies drive the care given, unless of course you go out and you're paying cash for services and such, but and even some demographics, like in a Medicare def- demographic, that's determined to be illegal to go out and pay for cash services beyond, uh, outside of your, your coverage because you have to go to a Medicare provider, supposedly, which is a terrible misconception of, of the law and the way that it's written and what it's designed to do. But overall, this idea is that insurance companies are really driving the direction of care. They're obviously seeing this, um, what they're doing with reimbursement drives decision-making because people are human. They're going to do what generates revenue. And unfortunately, the things that generate revenue aren't always in the best interest of the patient, whether that be the amount of time that's spent or that's the products that are used or the tools and modalities that are used on the patient, all those things are, are huge. So I think we should talk a little about how did we get to this place and maybe some evolutions of, of therapy and specifically as physical therapists, how we got to a position here that I think is, is interesting. So I know when back in like the 90s where I got super excited about doing PT, I went through, as everybody has, got their own injury, went in and started getting treated at a, at a clinic and had some great experience, but I've, I've always been driven by the idea of, can we do this better? I've always felt like, okay, this is a good experience, but I could do it better. Could we do it better? How could I learn to do it better? And that's really what driven me for the last 30 years. But it was a fun environment where you were, you were having fun with patients. Uh, it was a dynamic environment. You weren't behind a desk. It was something that was like, this is amazing, right? And then as I go into PT school in the early 2000s, it starts, um, things change as we start to come out of school and the fact that Okay, now they went from a, a master's degree, which many years before that was a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and then to a doctorate degree. And I was in a transitional program where I got both of those degrees. But as we go through that, that, that started to change the landscape a bit of the environment and, and going to this higher degree model. And it was, a bit, it was a big deal. And at the same time, we had this huge push from our industry that had to be evidence-based practice. We wanted to have evidence-based practice. And the idea behind this higher education model of going to this doctorate degree is we have direct access and you can go in and be able to contribute and, and help patients directly without having to go through a doctor, uh, which was a great idea. But unfortunately, insurance companies early have gotten on board with that and they still want a doctor's referral and, and such to do so, which really makes that degree relatively innocuous. It doesn't really do much doesn't give you all that much value because your direct access is so limited as it stands there. And the negative part of that, I think that really is over the top is now we're seeing the student loan debt that's mounting as a result of this, uh, this environment. They know it's higher education, education's charging more money. We have schools charging so much money. I know that uh, some of the programs around us here, we've heard that they actually have to charge so much money because it's a state school and the state's 
determining the, the cost of the education, what it's going to cost. The school has an influx of money coming in in this department and is therefore giving the money back to the students so they can go out and get continue use it for continuing education dollars or other expenses, which I think is amazing. Like <laughs> the department actually doesn't even need the money to operate, but they had to raise the cost so much. So now the students are in more debt and taking out more loans. And then that's creating this problem where we're not getting reimbursed more for the services provided. So now we have this huge like conundrum in the industry where we have these huge debts with with no change in reimbursement for the last 20 years. And it's really kind of set us off to be in a, in a very interesting spot in, I think, in our field, in outpatient, orthopedic, sports, physical therapy. Well, we're still in a spot, too, that people use their insurance. You know, I, th I think the, the thought by a lot of young people is like, oh, no problem, I'll just do cash-based medicine. But you forget, like, uh, you know, we're, we get into this, into this trade to help if you're in sports medicine, you live and die by athletes and people who are motivated with recreational activities. If you've got a, a great heart, maybe you just want to do people uh, help people that um, that are more in the adult, maybe a little bit elderly, but they're still moving and still doing a lot of exercise. And you got to forget that you can't forget that uh, people put a lot of money into their insurance. You know, it costs anywhere from you know three to five hundred dollars per person. So if you have a family and you've got two or three kids in sports and you have a, a severe ankle sprain that rips the ligament, then that parent has a choice. They could spend a hundred dollars. Uh, for a cash-based visit or $150 for a cash-based visit, or they can use their insurance somewhere and pay some medical dollars that um, that helps them tax-wise, and, and maybe they have a, a great benefit, and it's only maybe $20 for a copay. It, and they have to do that because they have all these other expenses. So the thought that you're going to do, you know, whether it's sports medicine or, or recreational fitness, activity outpatient medicine, but then I'm also going to be uh, cash-based, there's a lot of conflict there. And, and that's why I've kind of looked at the cash-based medicine model, almost like an affluent medicine or affluent massage medicine model. Because that's a lot of the people that kind of pick that path. They just want their tissue, you know, manipulated or mobilized and then a, and then a stretch. So you still have to solve the insurance question. And so we have to understand the history of how we got here, like you just said. And we have to look at this is the current environment of, of where insurance, insurance uh, reimbursement rates are are what they are. They've been fairly stagnant for the last 10 years, which is unbelievable, but that's just what they are. We haven't gotten paid more than, you know, $82 or $83 a session in a long time. And the worst thing is the Medi-Cal, the Medicare fee schedule, the final rule that just came out says actually they're going to bring it down 1.5%. That was in the WebPT report released a few months ago. So not only are they not raising, Medicare just said, you know what, we're going to bring it down a notch. And if you don't know enough about insurance, most of the big insurances and the big guys, the Anthems and Blue Shields and United Healthcare, they just follow what Medicare does. So we, we have a difficult problem right now to solve. Right, and I think the important thing that we see a lot of people just want to go out and complain and they just bitch about the insurance, right? And I don't think that's the right, the right idea. I think the insurance has been very clear about what they stand for and what it is to do. And I think we made a very clear push as an industry to try to become evidence-based. And I believe that in an effort to become evidence-based, the goal was to take all this overmounting evidence of how valuable we are and share it with the insurance companies and hope that they say, oh, you guys are valuable, this does work. But in the brilliance of this, it's been very, very difficult to be evidence-based exclusively, that there's not an amazing body of evidence that supports each individual thing that we might do as clinicians because it's very, very hard to do research on an N of one. You know, we could look at a study and say, let's look at, you know, in therapy, our studies are like 30 to 50 people are considered to be a great study, but that's a, that's a bullshit study in pretty much every other form of, of like science, looking at thousands and thousands of Ns, and, and our studies are like 25 to like 30 or 40 people. And it's, it's just not that valuable at the end of the day. And then we see scattered data. You know, the reason why the studies don't get big is we don't have enough positive data consistently to get us to that point. So I think that we kind of have shot ourselves in the foot here to some degree where we've gotten, hey, let's get more education, get this doctorate degree, pay this high student loan debt now, and then let's go after trying to get paid more. But yet at the same time, we really haven't been able to, to document the value of our services in the way that they're expecting us to do so as a, as a healthcare provider. So I'm not saying it's not that therapy doesn't work. I think that what we were trying to prove 10, 15, 20 years ago wasn't the right thing to prove. And what we need to do is look at value. How do we value? How do we really change people's lives? How do we improve their, their overall outcome? And, and what a value is that? 
and then reestablish this this idea of, of cost. I think as you speak there, it's it's great when you look at uh, you know reimbursement rate. What's what I'd love to see is a consistency on on a reimbursement. We have a couple of insurance companies that tend to pay in a variable way, where it's a, a scaled model, if you will. There's some that are very flat in the way that they pay, and the the flat ones are nice for us because they allow us to actually then build a business model around an expected pay scheme. Even if that pay scheme is a bit low, at least it's expected and it's clear. And then we can talk about building a model around that and how we can serve that patient and serve the, the, serve the employee that's, that's working on that patient in the best available way. I mean, can you think of any other business industry out there that has like such a, a variable scale of what it, what it might cost? Do you imagine like a sandwich business? You know, you get like a, a chicken sandwich, like ah, on Tuesdays it's three bucks, but on Thursdays it's actually six bucks and we're gonna switch it on you. So you never know what to predict. It's that, that's kind of how like this whole therapy thing. Sometimes we get paid one hundred and ten dollars. Where did that come from? Why do they think we're we're worth one hundred and ten? Other times they chart they give us forty five dollars. So it's a massive variance across insurance reimbursements. It's just kind of mind blowing that we're trying to create a business around variable rates. Not to mention they very easily might not give us the money. So then we do, we do the whole, you know, we check their insurance and we we serve the person. And then, oh, three months later, you're denied. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Or they just ask for the money back. You know, there's some groups out there now that are just requesting the money back afterwards, suggesting that it was, uh, you know, not valued or shouldn't have been approved in the first place. They just take it right out of the next person's pay. I mean, you have to be, you almost have to be um, insane to start a business and actually take insurance. It's like, <laughs> how, how could we possibly create a model that, that does all this? But I think that's what, that's the beauty of it, right, is that we found ways that this model does make really, really good sense. And I think that what I don't want to come off as is, is complaining about the insurance companies like they're all the problem. They're not the problem. They've been very, very clear what they stand for, what they see valuable, and they've placed a value on us that's lower than what everyone in our industry wants to accept, but it is what it is, and they've been, they've been consistent with it for years. Uh, certainly, we could all start a revolution and get together and say, we're not going to do this anymore. And they might say okay, or they might come back and agree to pay a bit higher. But all that's going to do is raise your insurance rate that you pay. So it's going to cost everybody else more, like everything else does in the world. So it's not about complaining about them so much. It's starting to understand just the game at play here and how things move. Because I think as therapists, a lot of times we feel victimized and they just go and bitch about it. And that's not what this is about. This is about understanding the game that's out there by the insurance companies the opportunity that's out there for cash pay patients, and then how you have to model your business in working with these two things. We were reading this uh, WebPT report, which they put out every year, and it's really good if you're not familiar with it. It's a great survey that they do. Um, Russ has the details on it. It's about 6,000 yeah, patients. Yeah, yeah 6,000 people. 50% of them were embedded in the WebPT system, the big EMR WebPT system, but 50% were not. So it's, I think it's a really nice sampling of like what's going on more in this outpatient orthopedic sports type of environment, because that's usually the people that are responding to the survey and have had to contact WebPT is usually those kinds of folks. And they do a really nice breakdown of, of where the folks who filled it out are from and coming from and such. But, so I think it's a decent hold of, of what's going on nationwide uh, across the board. So I like the, uh, I like the information that's provided there. It gives you kind of a nice rundown. And it's available for anybody. We'll share a link to it. Uh, through the site here so you can take a look at it and follow as well. Yeah, I think it was a fantastic report. So it's a 100, 100 page plus report. So you can spend a few hours looking through it. Um, you know, when we, when we talk about, you know, the overall physical therapy industry, it's pretty easy to kind of zero in on one key detail that the report uh, shows. It shows that um, that there are, there are a lot of uh, clinicians and therapists that leave their company, whether they move or they leave the whole industry. And they're crediting that to the word burnout. And a lot of young therapists are very aware of burnout. I'm not sure if the teachers are talking about it or if they hear that from you know their friends or colleagues. But the idea of burnout is uh, trying to tease out um, probably one of two things, either those who have very low salary and feel stagnation in their career. There's no room for advancement and they're not sure how to uh, climb uh, both financially and maybe title and maybe a responsibility. So that's uh, probably the, the top tier. According to this report, it is the top tier 
of, uh, of burnout. The second one is a very high caseload. So you have kind of like the, the two extremes, the tale of two cities that are contributing to burnout. And this is the clinician at the small mom and pop, you know, that, that doesn't really have any room for advancement nor room to grow financially. And then you have the typical clinician in a big box, big hospital franchise setting that's seeing 25 evals a week and managing a caseload of nearly 300. So those, those people are gonna see about 22 to 24 visits every day for a five day working week, according to the report. And we've seen this and heard this anecdotally locally in our region. So that is the tale of two cities that the report showcases beautifully. Right, so it's, it's pretty nice. And you can, again, going back to this idea of like complaining about insurance or going cash and this and that, it really brings that the idea of modeling. How is the business modeled? And I think we have to look back and, and recognize a few trends and what might be the best, most ideal model. So even in the report, it discusses some things like, are you a cash-based practice? Or are you insurance-based practice? Then there's a third, which is considered to be a hybrid practice, meaning do you take cash and insurance, which I thought was humorous, just the, the concept that like, <laughs> oh, did you have to identify yourself as like you allow cash <laughs> to be paid for your services? But nonetheless, having that hybrid model, I think is, is a great model. It allows you to be very, very economically sound. So even doing up and low times, insurance is very, very consistent, which is one of the big benefits of insurance. Um, and then you have cash as well, where you can really get immediate action and people that want to pay and have the ability to pay can get the care they need and they can go outside of the system they're used to and get what they need. So I think it really is a nice hybrid. We've been operating this way from the beginning because I don't, I can't see any other way. I think that if we go exclusive cash, then we end up really pushing a certain population away from us, as Raj said. You know, someone's got an ankle sprain or maybe they have an ACL and they need, you know, 25 to 50 sessions over the course of the year, that's a pretty strong amount of money that person has to pay. And I just don't feel eth ethically sound charging them this um, this high rate that it would require for them to pay 100, 120 bucks a session that many times where really they don't need me that often. They need me at certain times, at pivotal moments in the rehab process to change the case, to change the phase of exercise, to progress them, to work on range of motion if it's stiff, et cetera. But to say that, oh, you have to pay this much money up front it just seems a, a bit crazy to me. So I like the hybrid model. The other thing that's great about this when we talk about modeling is, is it discusses a bit of, uh, it breaks it out to outpatient orthopedic practices, breaks it out into hospitals, breaks it into more private practices, which are smaller groups, identify the number of people in the group, uh, solo practices, and then it has another category of in gyms or wellness centers. And this is something we've done from the beginning as well with, with Kive is that we wanted to develop a way we could provide care inside a gym and fitness facility for a couple of reasons. One, because it provides immediate access to active, motivated, dynamic folks that want to do something more and better. It also really reduces overhead costs for us. So it allows us to not have to pay as much for all the equipment, facilities, et cetera. We can share some of those costs with the gym and work really hand in hand with them, which is which is a great benefit of that type of a model. So that's one of our first ways that we've kind of attacked this low payment from insurance situation. How do you combat that? Well, one of the ways to combat it was we decrease overhead and we keep our overhead very, very efficient and effective in this model. So when we first started looking at this, uh, this report, they did this survey several years ago, it was five years ago or so, the first time we saw it. We used to be a WebPT customer, we're no longer a WebPT customer. Well, at the time we were, and we we're looking at their data very closely with this, and it was it was good. At that time, it was less than 0.5%. Point, yeah, point yeah, 0.5. Yeah, 0.5, yeah. It was a very, very low percentage of PT practices that were in gyms or in fitness centers. So now we've seen that number raise, but it's a whopping like 1.3% now. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still, growing. Still quite, still quite low on the spectrum. Um, but I think that's the model that really kind of fits what I, I know so many outpatient orthopedic therapists want is to work with sports environments, work with fitness people. And I just love that model where it brings us close. There are some problems we can talk about another time, uh, some challenges that you'll face in this space, but it's uh, phenomenal from, a, from a combating the, the reimbursement cost that, that we face that's being fixed. That's definitely, I think, the, the cool factor for a lot of young people that, one, young people tend to listen to podcasts, so uh, you know, there's that bias, but, but also a lot of young people coming into the scene of the industry, they're, they're looking at, hey, I want to start a practice, I want to go in a gym, and I want to take cash, right? Because I don't want to deal with the insurance headache because we just got to talking for 15 minutes of how much of a headache it is. And so how about we just do cash? 
So imagine if you happen to find, you know, 20 people that want to pay you 120 bucks a session and you just do cash. Here is one big threat to you personally. We could talk about the litany of, th of threats. But for the young people that are only going to take cash, that demographic is usually between the age of like 45, 65. They have common degenerative complaints. They got an arthritic knee and they want you to open it up every week for like three years. And they can afford you because of their successes. So what tends to happen is you don't manage as many caseloads. Very few caseloads, a very particular demographic. So one thing, here's the key thing that you lose as a young clinician. You lack experience. You don't get the breadth of caseload in different types of people and different types of cases. Because what you can say about taking insurance is that you might get more caseloads. And if you manage those caseloads successfully, then that creates experience because you're seeing people go through the flow of injury, whether it's a, a ligament tear, a tendon tear, a surgery, a severe trauma, you get to get those reps. And that helps give you a key thing in this, in this business is wisdom. Because a lot of people, you know, they kind of think that by getting out of grad school, you're, you're worth something to the world and, and you're not, you're not, you, you were worth enough to get a license, but you're not ready to like help a community through all the litany of movement things that they can, not quite yet. That's, that's called the difference between knowledge and experience, and you have to apply the two to really get the wisdom. So I think there's a big threat in the industry of all these people who are going to cash-based is you're just flat out not that great of a clinician, but you get fooled uh, because people might come back to you for other reasons. Yeah, I think it's a great point. You're certainly going to attract a lot of people that it's easy and it's direct, and that's I think it's attractive because the healthcare market is so, uh, like we said, it's broken, it's difficult, people are looking for a way out. So I think it's a, it's a fine option. The other things I would say that to consider from a cash pay practice, and especially in this fitness gym setting, is I think we want to, when you think about a business and you're like starting this as a clinician and you want to start your own business, and I want to do it on my own because I want to do it my own way, which I completely respect and think is, think is an outstanding perspective to have and should motivate you for your, for your entire future. But consider what are you building? Where, what direction is it going? What is the outcome of you building this thing? And I think if you look at some models out there, it gets kind of interesting. As Russ said, the target population that's going to pay you more of a premium rate uh, is probably going to want a little bit more of your time. So you're probably going to have a difficult time in a 30-minute session. You're probably moving towards a 45- or 60-minute session. And they're going to be paying cash for those services. And they're going to be, as Russ alluded to, maybe they have some some orthopedic breakdowns and some, some knee degeneration, degenerative-type prolonged things. So you're going to find that you're going to do some exercise with them, and they're going to really benefit from a PT's perspective on exercise. It's a great population to work with. Uh, but then if you look at the model, what you kind of end up becoming is very much like a personal trainer type model, where personal trainers will, will work with people one-on-one. -on -one. They'll work with them for typically an hour at a time. They'll layer them one after the other over the course of the day. And it, it's a really nice cash-based business. You think when you're first starting at like 20, but if you look around and look at the world, how many people are still doing that after the age of like 28 or 30 or, or later on in life? Do we still see a lot of personal trainers tr training people in that same regard? Do they do that for 20 or 30 years? Or do they do it for a, a run? And then they too end up leaving the field and becoming, going to the mortgage business or into finance or whatever else mm -hmm. uh, they might do for the world. They tend to, they, my experience, they tend to leave it. I think you have a very few amount that are over the age of 30. Some do it. And of course, if you follow the personal training business, they go into small group training where they bring three or four people in at the same time and do the work. So that's a lot harder to do in a kind of a therapeutic environment where you're trying to help someone one-on-one -on -one with their injury and work with their individual problems. But it's certainly a potential option. The, the, other, the other group that you want to watch that's kind of done this for a long time as well might be your, your massage community, where once again, they're taking a payment for a period of time a cash-based payment, and they're filling up their schedule for so many days a week. How many massage therapists do you see that make a career out of it or do really well financially long-term uh, with that type of a model? You know, Very few work full-time, and very few seem to continue it again later on. They do it for a year or two, and they realize, man, this is a grind. Like This is tough work. And then they, you see them you know, kind of migrating out of the field or doing it more on the backside as, as opposed to their primary income stream. Well, you know, you're, this is number three on the employment, employee resignation reasons. Number three is you want a job with better career growth and opportunities. 
and that's a I think it's a difficult thing in any medical setting where you have a license to do something because you know you, you went through all this schooling and you get a license and now I can do said thing so what does career growth look like and this goes right back to the model of you know what is career growth am I going to see more patients <laughs> am I going to work different hours am I going to become a leader and I think that's like the big concept of becoming a leader but going back to the massage therapist or, or maybe just the cash-based therapist that's seeing the same people every week I think one thing that's probably not um, seen in the data is boredom. And perhaps, you know, the reason for burnout is sometimes a lack of stimulation. So in the cash-based world, I think, (laughs) you know, if you're working for a big box gym, you have so much stuff thrown at you that you're living in chaos. But uh, if you go really, really small, then you see the same uh, 40 people every week, every week. (laughs) Nothing new. Same, same, same. You're going to die of boredom. And, and there's a famous researcher by the name of Mihail Chetsin Mahali. He wrote a book 35 years ago called uh, Flow. The reason why I'll say this, the reason why everyone even knows the word flow in the psychological realm is, of, is because of Mihail, probably the most cited researcher in all habit work, happiness books, purpose books. They all cite his research on flow. And he'll say the flow state, whether you're an artist, whether you're a clinician, whether you're into a hobby, the flow state is in between those two extremes. It's in between rules and chaos or boredom and anxiety. And I think we see this. We see this in the data. So I, I think there's threats. No matter how we create a model, are you creating a model with too much chaos, too much caseload? You're trying to treat too much in a day. You might be bringing in the money into the business, but it's insane on your brain and you suffer from anxiety as we we had a therapist that joined that joined us, and she said that her colleague that worked at a big box hospital chain was literally having a mental breakdown, and she had to stay uh, with that person a little bit longer so that, that she was worried about her health. Okay, so when you, for that type of clinician that sees twenty four people uh, and something new on Tuesday, something new on Wednesday, your, your your caseload must be hundreds. You suffer from anxiety for sure, and then you have the opposite extreme of I can't believe this is my life. This is what I have this graduate degree for, I'm going to treat the same type of person 40 times in a row. We have the two, two extremes. Absolutely. And that's it. I couldn't imagine treating like 20, 40 vows in a week. It's, yeah. it's insane because my, my own ethics would be like, how am I going to be able to follow up with these people and help them out for stage two, stage three of the process? There's just no way you could possibly give them the tools that they would benefit from the most. I'd feel like I'm underserving them tremendously for against what, what I believe in the most. So. And we had to answer that many years ago. Yeah. What is the sweet spot? Yeah, and, cho- and chose not to go that route. <laughs> and So let's talk about a couple other models. It's a personal training model, massage therapist model, probably ne- another model that's popular out there that we see in the healthcare field is the chiropractic model. And there's obviously a variety of models in the chiropractic world, but one of the most common ones you've seen is these chiropractors actually do make a very good career. They make a good living, they make good money. And then ask yourself, how do they do it? What are they doing? Most of the ones that are pretty successful in my experience have, have found out that they work a, a day, usually have like six, seven hours of treatment in a day, and, but they're really turning patients quickly. So they're using insurance, maybe they're using cash, but the price is very low. So maybe they're charging 30 to $50 or something in a session, or they're using insurance, and they come in, they might work with the person for maybe 10 minutes, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes at the most, and they might be doing four or five, six people in an hour. So they have this huge amount of patient volume, um, but they're really not, they're not doing as much exercise or as much movement or as, as much intervention as we might do as a physical therapist. So there's this conflict of that model kind of works. You can have your own clinic as a chiropractor, have your own name on the door and manage your own patients and do pretty well for yourself. But the, the difference is that you really have to see a tremendous volume of people like, like you're describing. And then I think with the model of care that we promote in physical therapy, especially what we believe in, at Kime and between Russ and myself here is that that just doesn't really serve people at the level that we want to serve them. So for us, that, that wasn't a model that worked. Yeah, I think also the chiro model has a, the chiropractic model has a few pluses on their side between you know really skilled manipulation, um, r- really detailed manual therapy. They're able to reset the body, and they put a lot of emphasis in their schooling. They put a lot of emphasis in their postgraduate um, you know, development to being able to reset, reset the body in a very unique way, a very powerful way that allows them, if done well, they might be very impactful on someone in a 20 minute session with very skilled 
hands. So they are kind of putting themselves very distinctly in this in this entire industry, very focused on that. Unless they want to do what PT is doing, more, you know, a little bit of manual therapy, a little bit of therapeutic exercise, uh, kind of put it in a 30 to 60 minute working session. But there's, I think there's few chiros that do that. Most chiros lean heavily into very skilled manual therapy. And if you're not skilled there, you then you sink the ship, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think when you look at the PT models, as you kind of seen outpatient orthopedics kind of transition over the years, one thing we predicted many years ago was that there'd be this huge amount of, um, well, consolidation, if you will. But at the end of the day, I learned early on in the outpatient orthopedic practice that if you went that route of holding a sole proprietor practice and you were the one working, what you really have is you have a job for yourself where the only way that income comes in is if you're working that job, if you're there serving those patients, which, which is rewarding and great, but you might want to take a vacation once in a while. Or you might get sick. You might get injured. You might want to, you might want to you know, retire one day and, and shut it down at some point and have, and have a future uh, beyond, uh, beyond patient care. Maybe your hands give out on you or you can't do some of these things after a period of time. So I think that's a huge risk of running your own practice and being exclusively in that. Plus, I think it's, it's a job instead of a business. So your ability to grow is actually minimal and your ability to reach out and impact the community is minimal because you're so busy treating the people in front of you. You couldn't po possibly go out and, and talk to a school or work with some, another group of kids or reach another community or, or educate others on what you're doing because you're so busy just treating to try to make a living that it's, uh, it's extremely exhausting. I think that, that's a huge burnout thing as well. So we decided a long time ago that there's strength in numbers, that we wanted to be something that grew, provide excellence in patient care and clinical care and not sacrifice this rapid turn and this high case volume. And so we looked at, we knew that our strength was gonna be that we'd have to multiply and have multiple therapists working with a similar philosophy and that we'd have to grow. We don't have to become massive and big and have this huge consolidation thing of 100 clinics or 200 therapists or whatever it might be. But there has to be a tipping point where one, one therapist is no good, two therapists is, is barely any good. As you start to get three, four, five, ten, 10, you really start to have this beautiful ability to start to scale the business where the therapist can start to really win financially because the costs are controlled and low. And it creates this model where you get this, the benefit. You can start to have some shared funds that go into vacation and retirement and some of these other things. And I, that's kind of the model we look to build and the model we've been building. And I think we've, we've reached that tipping point now and we're still seeing it uh, continue to grow and be successful. But it's because it's about clinical excellence on the ground, rewarding the therapist first and foremost with the highest pay in the industry to get the job done. And it sits in that space between kind of this private, solely owned, cash-based practice and more of your typical chain orthopedic physical therapy groups that, that, are, that are under um, having great success with consolidation. Because it makes consolidation makes great sense. I mean, from a business standpoint, it's perfect sense. If I had, just like it's happening in dentistry, so in PT and dentistry are both, have grown with consolidation over the last six, eight years at an alarming rate. They've slowed down a bit more recently, but that's only because it's hard to get money. So right now the, the interest rates are high so that you're not seeing as much consolidation because the, because the money's a little more expensive than it was. But we, what it makes a perfect sense, if I, get, if I consolidate, if I have two practices that are in the same community and they both have a front desk person and they both have a, you know, all the stuff, they have an EMR system, they have their own electric bills, they have all of these things, uh, they, have all, they need legal, they need accounting, there's all these dollars they pay every month in expenses uh, they have their own website, have their own phone, you name it. If I could take two of those clinics and I can combine it into one and I can cut most of those costs down by at least 30%, maybe 50% or even more, well, then all of a sudden now you have this, this shared model where you could, you, could, you could benefit the clinicians more, but the way that the thing's funded is not designed that way. The way the thing's funded in private equity and in scalability is that you roll it up and you continue to buy more and more practice so you get bigger and bigger and then sell it to the next roll-up group, uh, which is a great concept, but it leaves a lot of clinicians and therapists in the dust in the process. Cause yeah, that whole process treats the therapist like a pawn. Right. We as the doctor become a pawn of this much bigger game, which feels so sickening to me. 
that we can put our life and soul into education and, and research and development and, and care a lot about the community, all to know that our profit dollars are just going into um, some wealthy people's pockets and they will continue to be rolled up to the next wealthiest uh, group. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to see. But and I, and I think I don't know. I don't know a therapist that's in that model. That's like, this is amazing. I love it. You know, I mean, I think there's where you see opportunity in that model to do more leadership, to do more management. And but even then, I think you see some frustration or some, hey, I kind of um, I kind of took one for the team here and I'm, and I'm doing more leadership and I I enjoy the challenge of that. But at the end of the day, then there's less that are truly like thrilled with that that occupation, that lifestyle, because they're not doing what they originally wanted to do in life, which was really help the patient, serve the patient better, do this great care. They're just not able to do it in that in that model, in that, in that environment, in my experience. And serve the community. I think that's the myth. We get a lot of new people that want to join our company, and they say, uh, what kind of leadership opportunities do you have? And the big box chain are able to sell the leadership by just putting a nice title around it. And then that title means that now you manage inventory. You're, since you're the director, you get to manage inventory each month. That was your growth opportunity for your big career. And that's just, frankly, disgusting. Again, it's just absolutely shitting on, on you know, everything that we care a lot about. And so what does leadership really mean? What is, what is career growth really for a clinician that's knowledge based on movement and enriched in science and influence and coaching, what does career growth look like? And that's a big part uh, of this conversation because it's what, what is the model? And if there's, um, if there's revenue on the table and you're operating at scale, which for all the, the non you know, business people that are listening, operating at scale is exactly what Tony said, where we get to take a, a marketing dollar and a recruitment dollar, and then a, a dollar that's saved for the billing office and a dollar that's saved for the person answering the phone. And at scale, we get to say, well, we get to spread that dollar across five clinics, across 20 clinics. If we only spread it across two clinics, we're pretty limited. That means that dollar is extremely expensive. But if we get to spread it across all these um, other clinics, and all these other providers, now it's getting less per therapist or per revenue earned. And as we operate at that scale, we get to do more things with that extra revenue, like bonus programs, like um, revenue-based you know, sharing or advance in leadership opportunities. Yeah, I love that conversation for another time about leadership as well. Like what exactly that means is there's such a misconception that I want to be a leader and I want to be the director. And I look at some of these organizations that have PTs as directors, hey, you're the clinical director. But then you wonder what are they really directing? You know, and they're they're treating the majority of the time. And they're probably not really impacting the lives of their teammates all that much. I don't think they're meeting with them and looking at their performance improvements and looking at developing a, a development plan for that employee so they can continue to grow and achieve greatness. They're probably just like, yeah, you have CEUs. You know, we have a $2,000 CEU budget. You could use it for this. And, I, you know, you should go to that course. It'd be a great one. I know that in my previous, you know, 15 years as a clinician, I never had anybody, like, guiding me through that process. What we've done is to create this leadership the, the true progress of being a leader and going from a clinician to more of a manager or a director would be that not only are you excellent with your patients, but you're really looking at your teammates and looking at them, how can I improve other physical therapists around me and help them grow and how can they grow their career so they can increase their income? And then maybe they want to be able to manage and guide people, colleagues uh, in the future. So what does that really look like? So in our Leadership Academy, we handle that and, and approach that and I think in a very different way than is typically done in, in this space because that certainly doesn't show up in the report that uh, that we have great managers or great directors in the physical therapy field. Otherwise, there wouldn't be quite as much turnover. Completely, yeah. And, and for anyone who does have a manager or director, you know, behind their name or in their in their title, um, you know, I would ask like, what is uh, special about you that that gives you the role of a leader? Are you leading a community? Are you leading a group? Are people following what you say? Or do you have extra tasks? Because sometimes I think that leadership is is a uh, it's a fake word. It's it's a it, it might give you more finance. But here's the real problem. Say you're a director that manages inventory in a clinic, and say you get an extra fifteen thousand dollars to be in charge of some fake P and L that your clinic gets. Then, what does the real leader get? 
And the real leader is the one that moves a community, that connects with the athletic director at a high school or connects with the coaching staff of a, of a local baseball team. Who's the person that actually moves the community and helps and does a, an education event for all uh, right before spring league in baseball? What does that person get? Because if that director that's managing inventory in a fake, P, I call it a fake P&L because they're not really running the business, um, unless they got a finance degree or a business degree, I doubt they're running the business. So if that person's getting the extra $15,000 a year to be that director, then what is the real leader getting? And I would probably say absolutely nothing because that business doesn't have a leadership position that's assigned to real value in the world. That's why I say it's a kind of a fake leadership role. It's a made up corporate leadership role rather than a leader that's chosen by doctors, by coaches, by patients, by the people. That's, I think, the real threat is we're not honoring, we're not placing value on what the community deems as a leader, which is, a, I think, a big mistake. Well, that's the way businesses run in the world, right? Any business should be based on what does the community say your value is, right? That's the greatest thing about the free market economy is that it does that. And this is from where we started here, this conversation about how do we get what we got and, and what's happening is, that's, that's the idea, right? Is that we have couldn't prove our value. The insurance companies suggested that we couldn't prove our value by doing all this research about um, clinical practice and proving ourselves through uh, evidence-based practicing. Not that some great stuff has not come out of that, but at the end of the day, we clearly have not proven that we're worth more because they're not willing to pay it anymore, right? And even if you look at all the cash pay forms, it's the same thing. If you call what you're doing in physical therapy and charge cash for it, there's a conflict. Uh, rightfully so, as we discussed. So, yeah, I think it comes down to what's the value of the community? What do they see you doing? And I think what we can do in the community is so much greater than what's been done from uh, from our field. And that's probably where we belong the most, is out there helping improve movement in young people, perhaps helping them reduce injuries. But even if they do get injured, at least helping them back on the path to moving better as soon and as fast as possible. That's why the biggest thing we can give people is this idea that, like, keep moving, stay active, because we know that leads to all the other benefits of health. That's really undeniable, and that's from an evidence-based practice standpoint. There's nothing stronger than being able to move and exercise throughout your lifespan is the key to longevity and to having a healthy, quality life, period. Now, there's other things to add on to that that can make it a bit better and such, but if you can't move, it's really, really tough. This would be, this was what gets me so excited about our career and what we do for a living. And I, I think you look at all, all the, the fancy things out on, on Instagram and X and, and all the social platforms of, you know, whether you're following the, the blueprint guide or what, whether you're uh, following Peter Atia and everything he's doing or you've watched the, uh, the Disney show Limitless. I think those are, there's a lot of fantastic outlets that you can uh, learn intermittent fasting and exercise for health and take more vitamin D. I, I think the, the interest in longevity has never been greater. I think there's really wonderful information out there. But out of all of that litany of, of activity, it really comes down to how often do you move? Are you able to do it well? Do you hurt while you do it? And if you do hurt, you're probably going to stop that activity uh, that tends to happen with, with pain syndromes. So it puts us right square, right dab in the middle, right at this bridge, this crossover of, of understanding that I need to do more for my health. And then, but I, I can't quite yet. And I don't know why. We are at that bridge, and, and besides some great massage therapists, which we know of a few, some great chiropractors, which we know of a few, and, and really physical therapists at large, we're at this perfect crossroad to help with this uh, very, very trendy, very um, highly sought after way of living, of living for health span and longevity. I agree. I think from one more model I want to bring up that I, we looked at a lot when we were looking at modeling this business has to do with like the orthopedic surgery model. As fun as like who, how do you get rewarded? Who's who's the one that's being rewarded? And in in our field, it's common that the best clinicians get promoted to become the manager of the location or the manager of the of the region, if you will, or maybe they're a regional director of some kind. Maybe they continue to move up and become more involved in operations and and d clinical development and community development. But what's interesting is you don't see that uh, in other aspects in, in healthcare as much. Like if you look at the orthopedic surgery model, like granted, this is a group that does very well financially, that has great lifestyle, 
uh, they have challenges in their model as well, so by no means is it perfect, but they do very, very well financially. And you look at how they evolved and how is their model evolving, and you notice that you don't have a whole lot of orthopedic surgeons operating in solo private practices. They're, they're almost always in a group, and those groups usually do very, very well if they're well aligned, and the group has similar values and similar intentions in the community, they do pretty good. It falls apart a little bit when there's a little bit of ego or they get to challenge with each other and it starts to fall apart and you see guys break away. Um, and then of course it's being challenged by joining like a larger hospital group or some other larger chain group. But the point is, is that you see that orthopedic surgeons have moved to this more group model where you have multiple doctors operating sometimes independently within their own name or et cetera, but they're still part of a group or part of a larger team. And I think that's something that's important to consider when you're looking at how things develop. The second part about them is to look at is you don't take the best orthopedic surgeon in the group and ask them to manage the other surgeons. All right, this is your big point. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. If he's the best with big surgeon, he's producing great results, and he's impacting the community, and the community loves him, his schedule is going to be full doing that. He doesn't need to go over here and manage some other orthopedic surgeon. Now he should teach the surgeon and help deliver excellence and guide them in some way, but to go over there and be his manager or be his director or run the clinic makes no sense. Like He should continue to do what he's very, very good at and successful mm -hmm. with. And we've looked at the same model that in our business, if – a clinician successful and having great success, they should be rewarded for that success. Not mm -hmm. necessarily have to be promoted to go do something different, mm -hmm. unless they want to do something different. But if they're having great success there and they love it and it's what they got in the field for and they can do it in the right number of hours in a regular 40 hour a week and make a real living and, and be killing it, be rewarded for that. Yeah. Or be rewarded for developing more community impact. But not that you have to go off and become this pseudo or, or fake manager, if you will, of a of, of whatever it is. So if you take a, a phenomenal clinician, then and, and we're still going go back to what we said a little bit ago about the two extremes, the tale of two cities. Are they going to have a high ca caseload or are they going to be financially stagnant? And it's a shame, those two models, because they, they do. They, they burn out that person. But if you can not fall into either of those two camps and be a phenomenal clinician for the community, for your team, and inspire others and, and connect with people... This should be a path where that person should be worth, I'll put it out there, you know, at least $150,000 for a community, for a clinician that does this really well. And I think if you really move a community insanely well, maybe there's 10 teams that trust you and there's 10,000 people in the community that say your name, maybe you're worth 200, maybe more. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to have at least that idea because if, if all you're doing is, you know, we take a great clinician, let's see if they can do 24 people a day. <laughs> you know, you just run this hamster on the wheel too aggressively. You're going to burn out the best. And I think that would be the shame. That would be the ultimate shame of have our grad programs, you know, spit out some you know, great, hungry, highly passionate PTs that then get through some kind of uh, onboarding and training and development for one or two years with a good group and, and get, get some skill. And then let's, let's, allow them to achieve greatness just to burn out in 10 years. And, you know, what I think to myself, I tell this to my wife, I tell this to my kids, and I tell this with any therapist I can get close to, um, I really could do what we do every day, partly because I'm not seeing 24 a day. And a lot of it's because I'm not bored. As I see a variety, I help out with some pro athletes, I help out with some high school teams. And the day is variable enough where it's, it definitely stays interesting. Even my people who are more on the degenerative end they're still interesting because I have time to connect. And that should be worth something. It should be worth uh, quite a bit to the world when you can change lives in a steady fashion like that. But we shouldn't take the best and run them on a hamster wheel. That's for sure. Agreed. Let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little about finance and shift to that more of a topic on, on PT finance because the model kind of determines the financial opportunities for sure. Because you can find yourself with the wrong model that you kind of get stuck financially and then you end up in a, in a place that's really hard to get away from. Um, and you get commit. it's amazing when we talk to PTs that we interview that want to come on board or that might be interested in coming on board. The only reason they can't ever come on board is because they might have some like financial tie to the institution they're in 
whether it be some student loan reimbursement situation or it might be uh, some other longevity thing or, or retirement type plan incentive they have that they kind of got locked into early on that they have to spend so many years there to kind of get out of it. So it's, it's interesting. Finance makes a, is a really big choice. So I think when you look at the model and you look at what we're doing, what's really exciting about what we're doing is we have the a huge percentage of our therapists making over six figures. I think this year we'll have close to 50% or more of our therapists making over six figures in their first two years of practice, uh, period, not just with us, but practice, period. Some from the area, some not from the area. So they don't have to have this huge network coming in. So I think that's that's super exciting. And then that's a, that's a quite a small percentage of of the norm that's made that's in that category yeah yeah i'd encourage everyone to go through this this report and and um you know deep in the report like on page 80 or something like that it has salary by setting and you can see you know they they break out how many people are in each uh, category and and for the six thousand respondents of this questionnaire about 15 percent of them make over the six figure mark and you know 15 percent for doctors and clinicians that try hard and I'm sure do fine work. I can probably say quite with with pretty good certainty that the majority of those are working in the the big franchise systems. I mean an overwhelming majority. And I think there's a few clinics like ours, uh, business like ours that reward performance. Um, not many. And I think it's it's all going to change. Yeah, then you're, that's going to be that that's going to be the defi- deciding factor, right? Is when performance is about community value. And if you, if you don't impact, you don't have value, then it won't, it won't be there. I think that the report shows that as far as like how the money's split up and if it goes to um, how many clinics are, are part of a group and not in your absolutely right, there is a large portion of the folks that are making over that are part of these, these large organizations, which is directly tied to how many people they see. Not the value they provide or not the impact they have on the community they serve, but how many people they see. And that kind of incentive model where it's all about the number of people you see just really kind of leads us back down the burnout path where people are wanting to drive to see, you know, 18 people a day, 20 people a day, 22, 24 people a day, which is, I am not. I don't think that's sustainable. Well, the data proves that, that it's not a sustainable model to, wor- to work at that level of that intensity because you, for a variety of reasons, you fail, whether because it doesn't meet your own internal fulfillment, your own ethics, uh, you're just physically tired and exhausted and your body starts to break down. Um, or at the end of the day, the money's just not worth the amount of work and brain activity they're putting into this, you know? I remember when I first started in PAT, I thought it was, I thought it was funny. I've always been athletic, energetic guy. And man, my wife, uh, my wife's a PT as well, and we both started working at the same time at a clinic where we were seeing uh, three to four people an hour was the first, the first go around. This is back in like 2004, 2005. And man, at the end of the day, that's, you know, eight hour day and four people I and mean, these 30 people in the day is a, a lot, right? And of course, you had some AIDS and stuff, which really just, you know, is what it is. We'll talk about that another time. But I remember I get home, eat some dinner, and like by seven o'clock, 730, I'm passed out on the couch like asleep, you know, there's no energy left to serve or to do anything else I wanted to do, right? Which I think is the biggest, we see that a lot now in younger therapists coming up, like, I don't want that. They've heard not to do that, don't want that, which is supportful, like, don't want that for sure. Um, but it's very rare to have a model like like ours, and what we really wanted to build here was a model where you could have seen 11 or 12 people in a day, and perhaps maybe seeing 14 in a day. And if you're seeing 14 in a day, you're earning income well over 110, 115,000. Mm-hmm. And you're only seeing 14 people in a day, which is still less than your capacity in an eight hour day. If you had 16 every 30 minutes, 16 be your capacity, you're still well below that. And that, that should be relatively easy as your skill sets come through and acquire. And To speak with how rare that is, you know, recognize we didn't, we're not talking about age here. You're not saying you have to be 38 to make that happen. You can do this at any age. So if a clinician gets hired at 27, by the age of 29, they've built a bit of a network and they're able to see 14 a day and they're making, you know, about like $120,000. That person on this report is barely seen. There's only 4% of the entire respondents that make over 120 in the age of 27 to 33. So we're solving uh, a problem. And let's let's be really clear. Like I, I mean, think 
I'm not a, a, a big, obviously, oddly enough, I'm not a big money person. This, I didn't do, <laughs> none yeah. of us are. Right. Who, who in their right mind would, would do a work of passion yeah. and say, I'm going to be the next millionaire. So it, recognize it's not that. But if we don't solve that problem, there's not great alignment uh, with how the business model functions. And then what I personally think is important, like impacting people's lives and changing movement medicine. And I, I happen to love sports. And solving that problem of how to have high value to a 29-year-old that's able to see 14 a day, it's been, a, I think, one of the best problems we've ever solved. I, I'm so proud of, of that. It is, it's a mathematical formula. But looking at the data, I can see 95 other percent clinics don't solve that problem because they're going on an, off an archaic model that is slowly breaking. And it has to because yeah. it's creating burnout just like the report that's shows. It. And then that's exactly the problem. It creates, it creates the burnout. And then, you know, we have this student loan situation on top of all this that really now, now, they're, now the debt is higher coming out. So therefore, finance needs to even be greater than it's ever been before. And we just see this like downward spiral of this of this industry because of this. The model hasn't changed and evolved in a positive way to, to what we see out there in, in the large capacity of the group. So. Yeah, and it has to be solved for the, for the health of people and the health of movement and all all of the communities. This this is the problem to solve. I want to call up Heidi right now, the owner of WebPT, and let let's. Let's talk. I want to. I want to help influence this report for the next year, uh, because if businesses don't don't um, align to a performance based revenue model to help clinicians get what they're truly worth, uh, this this industry um, will not will not survive I except for those who get on on this path. I'm confident of that, and the and the report says that as much. I was really hopeful of that. That. We'd see groups like the other big groups like ATI and Athletico, and now part of Pivot. Um, these groups that are that are growing, that have these huge huge locations, they they do have a good chunk of income coming in, and I can tell you that their revenue and their profit margins are pretty large, with the with the models that they have and the way they've collected therapists and collected clinics, um, they're they're doing quite well for themselves. And I was really hopeful that they would then go and take that either to insurance companies to fight for use those funds to kind of fight for more reimbursement or more fair reimbursement or more more uh, improvement at least at least align it with inflation yeah <laughs> it's the starting only, point it's, for 20 years it hasn't improved as inflation continues to go up and this is this never hasn't moved at all it's kind of insanity so that that's one thing or then the other thing i was hoping that either them web pt etc could go after and con conglomerate come together and actually form better ways that that we operate, change the industry in a more positive operation fashion. And we just haven't seen that yet in a, in a large scale. There's been very little collaborative effort to really better the practice or, or better the opportunity for the therapists coming out. There's a lot of this complaining about it and bitching about student loans and bitching about insurance. But there's very few like problem solving of that. So I hope that that comes. And I know that we're solving it. And I think there's another couple other groups that, that we like that we see them moving in this path as well. And it's exciting. I think there's going to be a huge transition opportunity for the industry. And I hope that people can come together to, to do this better. I think what breaks us down and one of our problems we face is a lot of folks going out into those private practice models trying to say, hey, I'm going to earn it and I can make more money doing it for myself right now. And that's true. You are going to make more money for yourself right now. But that's not going to help you when it takes time to do a vacation. It's not going to help you when you want to retire. It's not going to help you as costs go up. And at the end of the day, it's just a job for you. You still got to wake up and go to that job at the same time every day. You're, you're, you're maybe working for yourself, but you're really working for your patients. We're all working for our patients. But if you could work together with multiple colleagues at the same goals, the same alignment, then there brings a little bit more money on the table that can be shared across the board so we can take care of each other in a much more positive way. Uh, definitely, it speaks to we're stronger as a team. Absolutely, you know, on so many fronts. And I think, uh, you know, one piggyback on one last thing the report says, it's really nice how the report picked up from all this data that one of the key things is, is the values. Do the values of the person match the values of the company? And I think that is now more than ever because 
what happens, whether, whether or not a company says it's their value or they act with that value is no matter what, that the, the business model and the alignment of how the, the policies and the formulas that, that are embedded that make the business run are those guts of the operations of the business in alignment with you know, the clinician's personhood. So if we agree that you know, teams, we're, we're stronger together for sure, then you just got to ask, does the, does the value fit? It's, that's a big part of the whole equation. What would you say to new grads coming up, people coming in, coming in the profession? Maybe they've even been in, out of place for a while and they're going to go interview. Uh, they're looking to maybe make a move in their, in their career. I think that's always a good question for therapists. They're always afraid to talk finance. Yeah. What should they be looking for in this kind of conversation around value? What kind of the questions can and should they ask? in this type of situation. What does success look like in this company? And if I kick ass, what happens then? Right, and what does that mean if you kick ass? Yeah. What does that mean to the company to say, hey, you're dominant because you're doing what? Because you're just seeing a high volume of people, right? You're seeing a ton of people and you're like killing yourself in the process. Great job, thank you. In five years, you're gonna be out of the field. Or is it, that you're that you're bringing value, you're doing your clinical excellence is there. That you're you're in the community, you're having impact on people around you. You're you're spreading this this belief in movement, and that better movement leads to better health for people more than just yourself, more than the people that are managing, leading the company. But it's a bigger a bigger purpose. Yeah, I th I think uh, looking at how does the company measure success, and then how does the team each team and how does uh, the individual and it, you could tell a business is purely off of production looking at the model so if the model is you know three an hour four an hour or say it's one an hour <laughs> you know that more or less dictates how much money can you can you bring in from the community so you have to kind of look at the model to determine that but then you also have to ask do they do they value your reviews do they value the quality of your care do they do they value what your patients say about you. And if the patient sings your praises to the coach and to the parents and to the booster club and to the team and things happen in the community because of your work, how is that valued? And I think that's essential because if the team wins and the company wins, then the individual should win. And you'd hope that it's proportional. And so I think a lot of therapists, they, they kind of want a, a safe, you know, I want to get paid $110,000 base pay. You know, that's what they say. I'm, I'm worth one hundred ten. dollars Oh, you're not worth one fifteen. Oh, Oh, no, no, I wouldn't be against one fifteen. dollars Like, well, how much do you think you're worth? And, and then they stumble, you know, like, well, well, is it 110 or 115 Or is it 150 And then their eyes start, what, you mean you could get paid one fifty? dollars Well, what if you could? Then, yeah, I want to be worth that. Or I am worth that. And, and, um, I think what's important there is are they looking for a safe base so that they could suck and still get it? Is it, is it if it feels safe, that probably means that they're, uh, they're not motivated to become better than what they are. They're, they're thinking, this is what I'm worth now. But if you're shown a path of what's possible, if you're really awesome for the community, then the company is betting on getting you there or helping you get there. And that's what you should be interested in is how how valuable to the community can I be with this team? 100%. I think that's a great, a great point there, too, that they have to... I think one thing we have to see as therapists is we have to become more, more confident in what, what we can generate, what we can do. Like, I think that this idea is that we, we interview a lot of, a lot of people that, that are interested in joining the team and coming on board, and there is this notion of safety, that they want this really safe salary. And you have to understand that the exchange of a very safe salary probably is highly correlated with you're going to see a lot of patients who are going to shove people down your throat, because then I don't, I I don't have any other way to to in, to improve revenue off of you. Like if the if the if your base is so high that you don't give the the business itself any way to be successful, then all they're going to do is throw more patients at you. So you're asking for the problem that you hate. And who's the easiest person to market to? Work comp, Medicare, and disease medicine. Absolutely. 
And so you see in all this stuff, it's like, that's not the population I want to treat. I want to treat those people. Well, then don't ask for a high base salary. Say, I'll come in at a moderate salary where it's really stable and I feel really good, but I'm willing to go prove myself because I'm knowledgeable and I can have impact on the people that I serve. And when I do that, more and more people are going to come. And my schedule is not going to full up out of control and be this 20 people a day schedule, but in, with 13, 14 people a day, I can have impact on those people and it's worth a premium. And then that should get you an earnings of somewhere in that 110 to 130,000 range. But that, that takes the confidence as a therapist to be like, I can bring this to the table. I have confidence in myself that I can serve the population and I can get people to follow me. Okay, fire right back at you. What do you say to the person who wants that right now? I'm 28 and I'm that valuable right now. Well, then the question to me is easy. Like, well, how many, where are your evals coming from? Where, where are you going to bring in these people? Because that's fine. If you join an organization and that organization has a funnel or a filter that's been building up for quite a long time and it has a community that's been serving for quite a long time, that brings a that's a tremendous value that they're bringing to you as a therapist. They're going to help fill your schedule. But if you don't bring anything to the table, if you don't have people that are following you already or other types of physicians, doctors, other referral sources, coaches, teams that you're working with, then I don't think you can come in and expect that I can get that right now because you haven't, you're haven't, you not bringing any value, proven value. But if you had some, then I think that's on the t that'd be great. Let's put it on the table. And then we'd have to probably set up some, some situation where if that doesn't happen, because people do have a lot of talk, like, oh, yeah, I'm great, I can do all these things. And then you get to the end of the day and say, well, none of that actually happened. <laughs> but if we could set up something and say, yeah, I love what you bring to the table. You've got some great resources. That's extremely valuable to us. It makes our company better. It makes your peers better. Like, we're going to really be able to serve that population people you're already working with better because we have more resources we could support you with. All of a sudden, this is tremendous. And if that all works out, then, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it right away. As you say this, I think it's so critical. You know, I think one thing I learned really quick in business is to treat the business like its own person, its own entity. And that person has a very hard time staying the exact same. It either wants to thrive and grow or die. And I, I remember my prior business that I, that I worked for, I mentally left as soon as my boss said, we're done growing. As soon as I saw that, I, I said, I'm out. So to flip that conversation, the business wants to grow. It wants to serve more people. It's part of its mission. And that business needs to honor the clinician that inspires the community, connects with the community, whether it's a team testing or meets a new doctor, meets a new coach, gets new business in. I think that's a very important alignment that the individual needs to see with the business that they're joining is that business wants to grow. It needs to grow. If it stays the same, it'll shrink and die. People will inevitably leave stagnancy. That's a really important concept. And I think if you are a new grad looking for a new team to join, you need to look at its history. You need to look at its values and say, are you thriving or are you just slowly dying? Yeah, that's, that is it, 100%. You, I never really knew what that term was or what that meant. You know, I mean, I've heard the term my whole life is if business isn't growing, it's dying. And it was in a similar situation where that became apparent to me. We're like, oh, now I get why people say that. Because if the business doesn't grow, the people that work for it will leave because they have to. Because the people that work for the business have to have growth. They have to have personal, if nothing else, mental stability. That they're growing and they're improving and they're making progress, at least in the patients they care for and the money they make, whatever it is, and, and perhaps in other climbing of the ladder if that's important to them which is not always the case, but if it is, then that's great and that can be a path they can go down, but they've got to see growth. And if the business doesn't grow, it can't sustain that person because there will inevitably be somebody above them or there'll be a limiting factor will not allow that person to get more to grow in the, in the entity. And therefore the person then has to leave. And if people continue to come and leave, then the business will die because it's not getting newer. It's not getting any new blood. It's not getting any new energy. It's not getting new ideas, and in five to ten years, there, there won't be a business to be there. Going back to, you know, the best surgeon should be doing surgery and not doing a whole bunch of management. It's the same, you know, if, if it's a stagnant business, that's lost its best people. 
and no business can survive if you lose great people. Yeah, that's what the that's what the business should be doing. The business has our business has two two basic strategic objectives. One is to be the employer of choice, to reward the people, take care of the people, help our people become more and more successful so they can live the life that they want. The second thing is to actually then serve the client, the customer of the business, which in this case is physical therapy, where people come in and they have an injury, they have, a, they have something wrong with them, and we're going to help them get to a higher level of function so they can get back to the life that they love. But as a business, you have to serve both of those groups. You have to even serve the team that works for the business, and then you have to serve the, the customer of the business. And I think that's a, that's a concept that's really, really foreign to, to many folks, and especially if you're starting your own practice, you want to go out and do it on your own, I, that, that's an area where you've missed that concept because the amount of work it takes to build a business to support the team inside of it that works there is, is absolutely incredible. Yeah, uh, and it has to be a, a definitely a, a, it's a... It's an insane mix of... Um, yeah, of, of frustration and despair, but also you're doing it for a, for a higher purpose. But going back to, you know, if I was a 27, 20 year old clinician right now looking to join a business, I would look at its history carefully. I would look at its growth, look at its values, and how does it reward success with the follow up for the first question being, what, how is success measured? And that, that does bring me to the, the famous book by, uh, by John Doerr. Measure what matters. I, th- I know that that changed my life when you recommended it to me eight years ago. But uh, I think in business it's common to know what your KPI is, but to make sure that your key performance indicator aligns very nicely to the company mission and that mission is supported by its values, that's not so easy. And that's not fluffy philosophy or just the soft science of business. It's real, and if you're joining a new group, you better be aligned, especially in the next few years to come, because gonna a lot of things be shaken up. This report is just showing a bit of the a bit of the the difficulty that lies ahead with inflation and a lower Medicare reimbursement. If that doesn't turn everyone's head in this field, it should. It means you just got officially got a little bit less value out of every insurance out there in the United States, and that means you better figure out how to find value in other ways because it won't be with the insurance reimbursement, at least not this year. All right. Let's talk about that real quick. You mentioned a couple of books there. Um, Measure What Matters by John Dewar is, is fantastic. That's a, that's a really, really good read. It's, a, it's a, a lot of content, so it takes some time to kind of get through that and really try to, to take that tool that he gives you and KPIs, or he calls them OKRs in the book, and really understand them and develop a practice around using them. I think that's been a, a huge, uh, a huge learning for us, and a book we definitely would recommend. Uh, another book that I think is is really paramount from a business perspective is the E Myth, uh, the E Myth by Michael Gerber. Uh, a bit of an older book at this point, but really, really, really covers this concept, especially in our industry of, of therapy, where you're a licensed professional and. The whole concept, the book's called The E-Myth, which is the entrepreneurial myth, where it wants to say, well, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, and I, I know how to do my craft. I know how to do physical therapy. Therefore, I should run my own business of doing physical therapy. And The E-Myth is, is a book that describes that topic and totally disproves that concept, that just if, as you know how to do the art of the business doesn't mean you know how to run and operate the business. And it was so interesting when I first read that book, I was working in a prior practice uh, with, for somebody else. And I found, I found the book humorous. You know, I'm, I'm laughing through like the first three chapters. I'm like, well, this is why we fail. I mean, <laughs> this makes it perfect sense to me, like why we're struggling and the difficulties we're having. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I found the book to be, to be humorous. So I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I've probably looked over it 15 times in my, in my early career as, as a CEO and a leader of the organization. And it has so many great points, and, and he has a lot of other great materials beyond that that, that I think have really shaped, shaped things we've done. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, if you're entertaining to becoming an entrepreneur, that's an absolute must. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. I think another book uh, that's business-wise that I think is a great read and influential, again, getting a little bit on the older side now, but really undebatable as far as uh, its impact would be Good to Great 
Um, good to Great by Jim Collins is 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 fantastic. Just such a good understanding of what took a company from a certain status to an, a status of excellence or elite. He was looking for what, what took a good company and made it great. And he compared a, a company with maybe two or three or at least one other company in the same field. Uh, and he looked at basically share value or stock price of that company. And as the value went up, because that's the ultimate measure of success is did you increase value. So as value went up, why? And what were the factors? And identifies at least five different factors in that book. And those are just tremendous concepts that continue to hold true throughout business. And I don't think we should get too far from the, the lessons that are that are in there. We reference them quite a bit in our conversations and, and how we approach things. Yeah, absolutely. I think that yeah, the, the value packed into those books of understanding, you know, how the business model affects every person on the team and how to move forward. If if you're a new therapist and you're joining a group, the questions you ask that group and the team and about their history and about moving forward, you can quickly tell whether or not the leaders of the organization care deeply about every aspect of their business or are they the e myth? They fell into that idea that because I'm a great tactician, because I'm a great physical therapist, I know exactly what I'm doing in business and the furthest couldn't be from the truth. Yeah. There's another great one too, like that that we that we read uh, this was one's called Small Giants. I can't remember who the author is, but it, it's a really nice conceptual book about small business and that small business's impact on the community, which for us is massive. And it is a nice job of summarizing how a small business has a lot of pressure on it, pressure to grow, uh, pressure to do things for everybody, pressure to do all these things. And it speaks about the ways to approach those pressures, handle them, uh, be strategic about the uh, the concepts there. So I think that's a that's a nice read as well. And probably aging ourselves here talking about books. There's many other ways that people get educated nowadays. And I know um, I know there's some there's you know whether it be other podcasts, whether it be uh, through Instagram, social media, or, or conferences, things you go to, I think just really be sensitive to where you're getting the information from. I think for me always, when I'm looking at social media or, or any type of people sharing information, is are they actually doing the work that they're speaking about, or are they speaking from a philosophical standpoint? And I, I mean, it's, unfortunately for our profession, it, it runs deep. I think that most of our education in this field comes from people who aren't doing it at elite levels. Uh, we look at even the way that in school, most of the professors in school are probably not the most elite clinicians and haven't ran um, hospitals or, or centers or orthopedic centers or private practices in their career. Sometimes they do and sometimes they are, but a lot of times they're not. So I think that's an interesting uh, way to learn is that you learn a lot from a person in that type of role that really hasn't done the role at the level that maybe you want to do it. So keep that in mind. I think from a social standpoint, it's the same. We see this on social media, and I'll, I'll just tell you this straight up from a revenue standpoint, that if someone is spending that much time on their social media to, to educate you how to run a cash-based practice or educate you on how to run your business in some other way, I can tell you they're not doing it. <laughs> because Especially if it's a post every day that you know took at least an hour for them to do. <laughs> maybe a quick two-minute video, but you know that they're editing it, making it cute, and putting those cute little fonts on it. it you, even if you're dialed 30 to 60 minutes per post. And oh, for <laughs> sure. The, the, my, that's my only challenge with that, with that uh, approach is that I feel like it's, it's inauthentic, where it's, hey, do this. This is great. You know, Use this model. Uh, for whatever reason, the model's promoted, but yet they're not doing it themselves in that model. And if they were, then they wouldn't be teaching you how to do it <laughs> yeah. at that degree because they wouldn't have the time for it. So, and then they'd be making enough money that they're claiming you could make by doing the model. That why in the heck would they spend time teaching it and doing Instagram posts and running ad campaigns? <laughs> they would just do what they were already doing. But no, they're doing something different. I think that you should learn from that as we look at the information out there. We should be sensitive to to where we're getting the information from, as always. Yeah. There's a, there's another book. We can just go on and on about books, and that's not the point of this, but there's another book called The Art of Impossible by Stephen Kotler. And The Art of Impossible, he talks quite a few phenomenal stories about just impossible things, that, that how do people do amazing things in life? And he has a little, little mini excerpt about um, how you absorb information. And he, he likens it 
to just absorbing someone's time, which I think, by the way, is exactly how we eat protein. When we eat protein, we're eating that protein source's food chain. When you read or listen to someone, you are reading or listening to their time investment. So he'll say to write a typical book takes him about six to 12 months. So when you read a book, you are absorbing one to 2,000 hours of thought and development and work and cohesion to have an idea, have a chapter, have paragraphs, and you are absorbing that energy. When you read a blog, a typical blog might take 30, 60 minutes to write. If you're reading a post, that might have taken two minutes to write. So when you absorb information, you have to ask, how much energy did you just absorb from someone else? And if it was an impassing thought, then you're just absorbing a lot of passing thoughts, which is the danger of learning through social media. Is because it's so easy and so quick to have a dispelling thought or have a, a quick, like, oh, this is going to be a bit catchy. This is going to be a bit cute. Whereas to read an investment of time is definitely worth its weight in gold. And there's no way we can become a doctor of a clinical science like us and not have some books that are read to formulate really cohesive thoughts. So I'm, I'm pretty passionate about um, to get people back into the reading bandwagon, whether, whether it's through Audible or hard books or do both. But if, if you're not absorbing information in a more authentic way of absorbing great energy from another, from another expert, then uh, you should be, especially if you're young, you need to gather a lot of information. <laughs> no, absolutely. I just want to give you a couple more here. I'm going through my Audible to see what else is, um, what else is hot on this, uh, this business topic. Obviously, Simon Sinek's Start With Why is a, is a classic. Uh, I like the title. Uh, I, I will say that I think if you understand the title that you might not have to read the book. Uh, but when I say that, you have to like truly understand the title. Russ has talked a lot about value today, and that's the why. And so you really have to take that, take that to heart. It's a, it's a phenomenal one. Um, but it's more of a concept. So if you understand the concept, then, then you're... You're really on the right shot there. You're on the right right direction. There was one other one I was gonna share here. I think I think Legacy is great as well by James Kerr. Legacy talks about um, they really going to go into the All Blacks New Zealand rugby team and talk about the legacy of that team. And if you're gonna build an organization or build a model. I think that you want to look at what who else is building good models that have lasting success, and that's probably one of the organ, the most successful sports organizations in the history of the world. Um, the consec- cons- consistency at which they win, and how they gather together uh, once again with alignment, values, these words we've used today, that really really come uh, come clear in that in that one. It's a very very good book. So we'll come back to you and give you guys more stuff on. Uh, books to read, things to go as we go, depending on the topic. There's quite a few leadership books that we have that we could reference as well, but that's not the, the topic of today. One other one I'd say from a business standpoint that we use that's that's pretty fresh and, and newer is called Building a Story Brand. So it's, the idea is building a story brand business, and it's by Donald Miller. And this is a phenomenal a phenomenal read and a phenomenal book to, uh, to go through. It's really kind of a play-by-play of how to approach uh, if you understand your why, then you can use the tools from this book to start to implement them and be able to communicate what you want to do in a very effective way. So, so enjoy that. Enjoy those uh, and topics. Thank you guys for tuning in today to Kimecast. It's been great. Uh, it's been great talking, Russ. Well done. See you, Tone. All right, buddy. 